Welcome to the NU Digital Classroom. I'm your host for today's episode. Um, I'm going to go with that because I tried like three different freestyled intros. And uh, yeah, today we're just going to look at this chapter six, right? You guys know the routine. It's like every week we're going to do a different chapter. This week we're looking at chapter six. We're looking at this idea of social and emotional development in childhood. We're looking at how it is sort of this reflection or this manifestation of a lot of the changes we see under the under the waves physically and cognitively in the last chapter now in this chapter we're looking at how this sort of plays out in the kid's life All right hope you're doing well sending love up to nipsing and to wherever you're at and uh let's get into it so one of the big things that changes as the kids getting older is this development of their understanding of who they are right and if you think of what this word self-understanding means, it, just think of, again, these last few weeks, we've been kind of touching into this topic of self and into this idea of like the child as they're growing, they're getting a more and more complex view of who they are. And some of that's emotional. Some of that's how they're different than other people. Some of that's how they're similar to other people and who they like and who they don't like and what things they like and what things they don't like. And they're all, they're developing this sense of self. We'll call it identity later, but at this point, they're developing this, this sense of self and this understanding of that self. During the second year of life, um, children make considerable progress in terms of self-recognition. In self-recognition, like being able to recognize yourself. In the early childhood years, then young children develop in many ways that enable their, their and enhance their self-understanding. So we see that, like, you know, when we talked about this earlier, that by the time kids are getting to a certain age, they're starting to be able to, like, brush off the, the powder on their nose when they're looking in a mirror, showing that they can tell that it's them that they're looking at. But so they're starting to become aware that they're their own person. And then that understanding of what that means and who who they are is getting more and more complex. Like in chapter four, we learned that then the child's starting to decide. This is Erickson's idea of trust versus mistrust. The child's trying to decide, like, can I trust this world and can I or do I develop this deep set? sense of mistrust and this is something like I had even taught on this before I really kind of got the depth of how much mistrust isn't just the lack of trust it's an active distrust when he thought that the main stage of of that infant first stage is, is trust versus mistrust and then he, when we're talking about infancy we talked about autonomy versus shame and doubt. And then, sorry, I didn't even put the points up yet. So I'll give you a second here to write this. That the child's self-understanding is their cognitive representation of self. So think of what that means, right? Like how they represent themselves as the character in their own mind, how they think of themselves, how they represent themselves, who they are in their mind. And that there's key things that are associated with influencing this. And this is uh, starting in a kind of psychoanalytic position, right? Like I'm talking about Erickson here, right? We're going to be talking about how Erickson says that in childhood, these things like developing a sense of initiative and developing a sense of industry are actually really core key things. Things that have been very threatened over the last few years, right? With kids like not being in school and stuff. It's like, why is that a threat to kids? Well, because kids, there's certain things they only learn in peer environments, right? In peer environments. This is a Albert Bandura idea, right? You've heard of Albert Bandura before. One of his big ideas is that if you deny kids, kids, like the access to friends and people to play with, that there's certain things like their ability to compete, their ability to handle critique, their ability to cooperate, their ability to show intimacy. It's like, so many things, intimacy in a friendship way, so many of those things can only develop horizontally. There's a, there's things, certain things that are hard to teach my child because the difference in relationship, like obviously a parent relationship and a peer relationship is different. Okay, so let's, let's just go to the next slide, sorry. All right, so this... So this is one of Erickson's key stages, right? And just to kind of touch back on that last rant I was on, it's his point is that kids playing with blocks at school with other kids and kids learning how to like draw by 
doing it with other kids sitting at a table and like kids going out and running around with a soccer ball at recess. It's like those aren't just like nice additional things that would be cool to have in a childhood. They're key developmental components of the creation of fully functioning healthy human beings. That physical com activities, doing things basically, is a central component of the self in early childhood. It's how they're developing their idea of who they are is by exploring and experimenting and being challenged and being tested by their world. Right? And that this is when kids are trying to like, and, and you can see like if you impede this, if every time your kid goes to, to walk, you stop them. And if every time they go to speak, you, you quiet them. It's like you're, you're going to impede that development. Right, and the child's going to be too young to really understand that. And Erickson thought that that gets internalized as almost like a biological, deep felt guilt, right? And that the child obviously couldn't articulate in some like grown up way and say how it's affecting their behavior, but what which clearly would, right? And this is why these psychoanalytic ideas are deeper than people think. It's like it's not like the kid, obviously, obviously, like you all know, obviously, the kid doesn't know they're doing this, they're not like, oh, I need to like do these block activities so that I can like understand who I am and so that I don't feel guilty for not doing it it's like no that Erickson said this is biological like it's like the kid has this like biological impulse towards doing stuff just like they had a need to develop trust and just like as teenagers there's going to be the struggle to develop a sense of who we are and then as people in their 20s and 30s it's like who am I going to be around right intimacy like some of that's romantic and some of that's friendship and some of that's work wise. And then the next stage that like my stage is like, is what I'm doing meaningful or not? And so Erickson said that that's not just like a small thing. Right? So it's like, Yeah, it's just not a small thing. By early childhood, children use their perceptual motor. I'm just going to read a little bit. Sorry, the webcam is kind of weird. It's like I realized that the laptop built in cameras what made it get that like green. If you watch that one video on social determinants, it like had like a weird flicker. But when I use this webcam, it doesn't seem to. So that's why I'm using it. By early childhood, children use their perceptual motor cognitive language skills to make things happen and become more convinced that they're their own person. They start to, and again, it's like not like their cognitive would be, it's not like in their mind they're like, oh, I made this thing out of blocks. I must be more of my own person. It's like way more psycho deep, psychodynamically deep than that. That's a good new term, right? Psychodynamically deep. They, I, they have a surplus of energy that permits them to approach new areas, even if they seem dangerous, right? With this undiminished zest and increased sense of direction on their own initiative in this stage, children can move out exuberantly into a wider social world that got kind of wordy, but just this idea of like, this is what being a kid is. The kids need to like, part of being a kid is exploring and exploring means a whole bunch of stuff. And Think of initiative as that like motive, that push to explore, to do things. Think about at work if your boss was like, oh, you, and they say they were talking about you and, they're, and your boss is like, oh, she has great initiative. That would mean that like, you don't have to have someone watching over you. You can like do stuff on your own. You can be, and like, I know we're talking about kids, but like, just to go back to the example of say it's your boss saying it about you, what that probably means about you is that like, you could get a task and you could just do it and your boss doesn't have to like worry about your performance level. It's like you can take something and run with it. You hear people say comments like that. That's like a way of saying initiative. It's like that that's something that kids have this developmental push, this biological push towards saying biological and developmental are almost similar words, right? Because biologic developmental means it's an impulse that happens to you during your lifespan. Right, because you develop within the lifespan, you evolve over multiple lifespans, and that that drives coming biologically. You know, and and he thought that this was really connected with this idea of what we call conscience, right? Not conscious, like conscious or unconscious, but conscience, right? And you've heard that word before when you've. The easiest way to explain it is if you went to steal, say you went into a store, you're all adults, you could easily go into a store and like steal a Mars bar and walk out and it's like you say you got away with it it's like 
but you felt bad. What do you mean you felt bad? Right? And in our con in our culture, we say, well, maybe your conscience feels bad. So what's that mean? It means like, well, well, Erickson thought that this kind of comes from at this stage, right? That that same voice that makes you feel bad can make you feel guilty. And again, just to say one last time, it's like there's no expectation that a child would be able to articulate that. The great governor of initiative is conscience. Children initiate uh, initiative and enthusiasm may bring them not only rewards, but also guide guidance, which lowers self esteem, but also guilt. Yeah, if they don't develop it, which is lower self esteem. The last point I have, I, I, if you're looking at the note, I, I spelt guilt as guild, like a guild, like a lodge of people that follow a secret society or something. That word just threw me. It just was supposed to say guilt. So that last sentence, parents and teachers play a key role in fostering initiative. Like that's a important key last point that like one of the big things, roles you play as a parent is influencing this, influencing your kid's sense of if they can actually like want to do something and do it. And I'm going to show you on the next slide how this pairs with the next step. Okay, so then this, I was kind of hinting at this next piece, right? That he says in the next stage is industry versus inferiority. And you've maybe heard people use terms like inferiority complex and think of what that would mean that I'll explain industry in just a second, but inferiority basically means like feeling like you can't do anything. And it's like, you can see how that becomes this feeling like I can't accomplish anything and I'm not having any chances to show that I can accomplish anything. And then what happens, the dangerous thing that happens is that gets generalized, right? So think about it. It's like failure, 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 no opportunities to show your industriousness, which I'll explain in just a second. And the idea of the inferiority complex is that can like, that sense of not being able to do anything, not being able to affect your environment, it's very similar to a concept like learned helplessness, that that starts to, when I say generalize and why the word generalize is really dangerous in this scenario, it's because generalize means you learn that you, or maybe, maybe you had things in your life that led to failure in this area, this area, and this area, and then it makes you kind of like, just to explain it, assume that you're then going to have failure here, 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 here. In your mind, it gets generalized. I'm just failure. I am a failure. And so Erickson said, like, that's why developing industry is so important. And you think about industry, think of how you've heard people use the word industrious. It's like, say, if uh, just to use an example I used on the last slide, say, if your boss said that you're very industrious, and it's like, she's really industrious. What would that mean? It would mean that Maybe you're somebody that, you know, your boss says, yeah, we're thinking of like some new marketing ideas. And then the next day you show up and you got like six different design options and you're like wanting to really jump at the project. So initiative. So that sounds a bit like initiative, right? Initiative is sort of that drive to do it. Industry is sort of like learning skills that you're doing. It's why in the background there I have like a girl learning math and a kid and a boy learning how to read. Right. It's like that. It's why school is important. It's why you have to actually be there and do it. That children need to be encouraged. And, and it's like, I should be preaching to the choir a little bit, right? Like, meaning that's like an old school saying to me. That means that like, the people I'm talking to probably already agree with this point because you're getting into a field like child and family uh, studies, right? Like, like a lot of you I know have very strong interest towards either the teaching profession specifically or, or things around that. I know not all of you, but a lot of you. According to Erickson, middle and late childhood is characterized by this industry versus inferiority. Industry, oh yeah, I was gonna make this point though that I always tell my students at Conestoga, think of industry, what's the first thing you think of? And someone almost guaranteed will put up their hand and say like a factory, that's an industry. And then I always use that as like a talking point, right? That like, yeah, that's actually a pretty good example of what Erickson means, like what's a factory? Factory is a place that you go to make things, basically, like super basic level at that. Then it's like, okay, we'll take that concept over to here. It's like, what do you do at school? Well, yes, my daughter. It's like, well, we start at the one activity table and, you know, we 
like I'm talking about when she was in kindergarten, like last year, she'd like the one activity table where they draw and then they go to the other activity and there's blocks and the other one they work on their spelling and then the other one they work on whatever numbers and then the other one they work on something else. And she's like, we just do a bunch of stuff. It's like, yeah, but that's kind of the point. It's like kids at that age. And this is where someone like Piaget played such a huge role in kind of making this argument that kids aren't just young adults. A kid's not just a less smart version of you. They're at a completely different developmental stage. And depending on the stage they're at, they need to be challenged in stage appropriate ways, age appropriate ways. And, and you, we all know this. You're not going to give a kindergarten calculus. It's a, We all know this, that there's development in learning, right? But what Erickson's trying to really hammer this point is that don't underestimate how much of it is just physical. It's just actually doing stuff because it's not just actually doing stuff. Playing with blocks is actually a complex cognitive skill, right? It's complex how fine motor skills developed. It's complex how two humans can be making sense of a situation and doing it in a way where they're, you know, what we from the outside call playing. They're making it enjoyable enough for both of them to keep doing it. It's like they're developing their sense of self. The physical activities are a central, are a central component of the self in early childhood. Industry expresses this dominant theme of this period that children become interested in how things are made and how they work. When children are encouraged to build things, to make things, to work, whether it's building a model airplane or constructing a treehouse or fixing a bike or solving math problems or cooking, their sense of industry increases. Conversely, so an opposite. Parents who see all of their children doing this stuff as just being like a mischief or a mess will tend to foster more inferiority in their children. It's such a tough one, right? If you're looking at that honestly, because it's like, what's the warning to parents? The warning to parents is like, don't view all your kids' art stuff as just being a mess and all that. That doesn't mean you can't get them to clean it up, but it means that, well, this is the argument for school. That it's not just a nice extra thing. It's not just daycare. It's it's developmentally significant. Okay, I'm gonna to try to read this part first because I found the last two slides. I explained the slide, then most of what I read was just the same thing, but Okay, so if you kind of focus, the slides is usually the more kind of point form version of the, the content I'm talking about on the particular point, right? So two main differences are evident when you're looking at how kids describe themselves early in childhood versus in middle childhood. So by that, I mean, if you're to ask like, well, just a kid in early childhood, tell me about yourself. And you say the same thing to an older kid, the type of things that they tend to talk about are different. Right? So like, say the younger kid's more likely to talk about maybe their hair and more physical characteristics, the older kid becomes more and more likely to talk about more psychological traits. Okay, so anyways, I just like stole my own point, but what's the difference between these two? The first is a shift in describing oneself away from more concrete physical things towards more psychological things. In early childhood, young children often provide self descriptions that involve bodily attributes, right? Like how tall they are, what color their hair is, what kind of things they have, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a blonde, I'm a blonde haired uh, kid. Someone's like, tell me about yourself. Well, I have blonde hair. I'm tall. I, I play with trucks, you know, whatever it is, right? It's like, but see how it's very physical things. That was a terrible job explaining that, but you get my point. I'll say it again. In early childhood, young children often describe self descriptions that involve bodily attributes, so about themselves, material possessions, what they have, and physical activities, like what they like to do. Uh, for example, preschool children often describe themselves in terms of things like they, what they like to play. Right? Tell me about yourself while well, I like to do these things. In middle and late childhood, especially from 8 to 11 years of age, children increasingly start to describe themselves with more things that we would call psychological characteristics. Like I'm someone you can trust, I'm a loyal friend. Older children are more likely to, to describe themselves as things like popular or nice or helpful or smart or dumb. 
but notice how these are now becoming almost like labels of psychological characteristics. In addition, during the elementary school year, children become more likely to recognize social aspects of self. Okay, so let me just slow down for a sec. I'm saying, as kids are getting older, the way they're seeing themselves is changing in two main ways. One is that it's getting much more focused on psychological variables, but at the same time, how they see themselves is becoming more and more shaped by how they see themselves compared to other people. This comparison component, right? I'm, I'm not as cool as this person, so I must not be cool. This person's more pretty than me, so I must not be pretty. This person's cooler than me. And it becomes about how it ranks socially this social comparison aspect. And I'm going to talk about this in, in relation to things like you might know where this would be going in relation to topics like self-esteem and stuff. There's no surprise that this is when self-esteem starts to become an issue for kids. It starts to become an issue and they start to become more aware of how they kind of fit in the social status wise. And it's not even necessarily real. So here's what I mean by that. Say, let's look at something that's like really an easy example, like say soccer skill, right? You take a kid that's like decent at soccer. Let's say 10's amazing at soccer and one is, you've never played soccer. Say this kid's like a seven, right? But he grows up playing with all kids that are nines, all kids that are better than him. And you take that kid and you ask him, how good are you at soccer? He'll say that he's terrible. But you take that same kid and you put him with all kids that are fours, way worse than him let him play with them for grow up playing against them and then you ask him how good he is and he'll think he's awesome so the point I want to make is he's a seven in both examples that how good he sees himself is completely related to how he sees himself related to the group right so then well, well what if the group's expanding what if the group is social media and snapchat and blah 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 it's like we're going to get into these kind of topics of how this then relates to things like self-esteem right because it obviously does it obviously is a problematic thing that as kids are hitting this like pre-teen -pre age and into the teen years they're becoming more aware of everybody else more aware of people looking at them which is interesting too you're never better at noticing facial expressions than during your teenage years which is interesting, which is evolutionarily makes sense. It's when you're most likely to be taking risks outside of the family with potentially new people. It makes sense that the people that had the genes associated with being better at doing that would be more likely to have offspring. You could say it like that. Okay, so consider a study in which Diane Rubel in 1983 was investigating social comparisons. Children were given a difficult task and then offered feedback on their performance as well as information about the performance of other, other kids their age. Children were then asked for their own self-evaluation. Children younger than seven made no reference to the information about other kids' performances. You got six out of ten. Most kids get nine out of ten. How do you feel about getting six out of ten? So that's that's a study, right? It's like how much does you how much does you knowing that you did better or worse than the group affect you? And the point is in the study that yeah, children younger than seven made almost no reference in what they're talking about to the information about other kids' performances. However, many children over than seven would include that social comparative information in their self description. Well, if I only got four and everyone averages to get eight, then that must mean I'm stupid. I'm trying to like hold that pause for a sec to just make you think like how that's obviously linked to things like mental health and teenagers and self-esteem and all these other topics, right? That one thing that's really important to realize is, as, and, and I get not emotional, but I get a little bit intense around this topic because I think it's like the most underlooked at thing in psychology almost is like how psychologically vulnerable emotionally and, and socially young teenage girls and boys but especially girls and the reason I say especially girls is because especially of how when you start to consider things like marketing and mass media and how much products are aimed at that population whether we're talking about you know all kinds of things it's the biggest consuming group in the world in some senses right it's like the amount of advertising that's aimed at kids that are very sensitive to what people think about them 
so sorry i'm getting a little bit ramped up but i find that really especially with two young daughters of and and just in general it's like it's uh there's an aspect of advertising that's sort of like the underbelly of psychology it's like it's like well you can understand human beings and you can use that understanding to try to help them or you can use that understanding to try to manipulate them right whether it's to buy products or to say what you want them to say okay let's get back to happier times next slide testing testing okay i'm in a new facility sorry i, I hope the i think the setup's basically the same i got my webcam and uh trusty mic here so i think it should be normal that in one of the teaching pods at Conestoga College actually because my wife has some friends over doing like a craft thing so I thought um you know it's just quieter here and uh yeah and I rewatched the last slide and I got a little amped up there at the end but I think it's uh you know an important topic so let's get into this self-esteem This idea of self-esteem referring to a global evaluation of self and this word global is meaning sort of like the opposite of, of uh, specific, like some things are like specific and some things are general and so general that they're actually like global, universal, similar language. So when it says that it's a global evaluation of self, it means it's not like how you feel about yourself in one scenario, it's like how you feel about yourself in general across all scenarios. Sometimes this idea is called self-worth or self-image. For example, a child might perceive that they're a good person. Although this is closely related to the idea of self-esteem, self-concept is slightly different, that second term, right? So it's almost like this idea that in your mind, you have an idea of who you are, which is your con self-concept, the concepts you have about yourself, self-concept. And then you feel a certain way about that, and that's your self-esteem, right? Like, if you say that you hold some person that you respect in high esteem, what's that mean? It means, like, you hold them in, like, high status. You value them. You respect them. You honor them. It's like, well, how much is that true of self? Children can make evaluations in many areas of their life, right? They can have a concept of, like, how they are in all these different areas, and in a second, we'll talk about that idea of self-efficacy again. But like, self-esteem is important because this is a, a more generalized thing. And here's a kind of interesting point I often make to students. It's like, you take a six-year-old and how good that six-year-old thinks that he is at soccer or she is at soccer is going to be depending on how good their friends are. Right, so if they've always been playing around friends that, are, that aren't very good and they're one of the better players, they'll think that they're really good. And if they've always been playing with um, groups of players that are much better than them, they'll think they're not good. But the point that I'm trying to make that's interesting is that they're the same level of competence or proficiency or the same level of good at soccer. In both examples, what's changed is who they're comparing themselves to, right? And a big thing... This is kind of the point I was making on the last slide is this social comparison becomes such a big part of the middle to late childhood humans psychology. Mm -hmm. So low self-esteem and again, like it's like tough to say, right? Like low self-esteem is just associated with all like the things that as a parent you would worry the most about, like things like, like anxiety, depression, suicide, drug use, delinquency. One study revealed that youth with low self-esteem had lower life satisfaction at age 30. Another study found that low self-esteem, uh, low and decreasing self-esteem in adolescence is linked to adult depression two decades later. The link between self-esteem and school, school performance appears to be somewhat weak. Right, so it doesn't affect school performance as much as we might think. Um, and so then it would naturally put you in this position where you think, right, that like if self-esteem is such an important part of the developing child psychology, then we must prioritize things that increase self-esteem. And you can see how that becomes a very 
understandable and even noble perspective. But I want to get into some of the potential risks with that, right? Because well, what are some of the risks of praising? It's almost like if we go back from a psychology perspective and look at Skinner and look at his ideas around reinforcements, which praise is a type of, it's like, okay, well, what, what happens when your schedule of reinforcement is what he would say, like how often you praise and what you praise and when praise is given, what if that just becomes so generalized that you're just like kind of giving praise for everything and the child like almost doesn't even believe you? I'm going to be making this point that whether the child believes you or not is really important related to self-esteem. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that on the next slide. So I'd like to just read this to you. Teachers, social workers, don't worry about writing this down. This is just kind of a little rant. Teachers, social workers, healthcare professionals, and others are often concerned about low self-esteem in the children that they serve. One temptation is to deliver more frequent praise. But a growing body of research suggests caution in using this approach. Too many of today's children grow up receiving praise for mediocre or even poor performance, and as a consequence, can have inflated self-esteem. This then becomes problematic because it can give an increased difficulty in handling competition and criticism down the road. Narcissistic parents especially can overvalue their children's talents to the, to the child's detriment. This is vivid. Viv Sorry, oh darn, I was on a decent roll there and then I messed up. This is vivid, <laughs> this is vividly, oh that's a tongue twister. This is vividly captured by the book, The Dumbing Down of Our Kids, Why American Children Feel Good About Themselves When They Can't Read, Write, or Add. A series of studies researchers found that inflated praise, although well intended, may cause children with low self-esteem to avoid, to avoid important learning experiences such as challenging tasks stumbly there sorry basically just that like it can make them avoid anything where they might not get that praise which is actually huge right because it means that it's it's associated with less resiliency less ability to push through obstacles a study by Kang Lee and others at the University of Toronto provide a poignant example strong example of how the type of praise delivered influences a child's behavior Preschool children played a game and were praised in one of two ways. Some kids were praised for their ability. You're so smart. While others were praised for their performance. You did well this time. Children who were praised for their ability, you're so smart, were more likely to cheat when given the opportunity to do so than were children who were praised for their performance. You did well this time. Consistent with previous evidence that praising children for intelligence undermines task enjoyment and can reduce persistence after failure. This study calls for a very thoughtful approach when praising children. Praising a child for being smart produces a pressure to perform well in the future in order to meet others' expectations, pressure that can lead to negative behavior. Okay, so researchers have suggested several strategies for actually improving self-esteem, right? Because it's not like I'm saying that we shouldn't care about improving self-esteem. What I'm actually being critical is, or what I'm being critical of is some of the efforts we've done to try to do that, right? That this idea of just praising everything doesn't work. Actually, the number one thing here is to identify the cause of the low self-esteem. Any self-esteem intervention that's gonna be successful needs to address why the kid or the teen has low self-esteem in the first place. Because, well, I, so it says here, number one, identify the cause of low self-esteem. Intervention, interventions should target the causes of that low self-esteem. Children have the highest self-esteem when they can perform competently, like get success in the things that are important to them. Therefore, it's really helpful to encourage kids to identify and value the areas of their competence, like where they think they're good at things, where they're not good at things, and how much they care about that, and then help them get better at the things that they value but don't feel good at. And one, then the second thing says provide emotional support and social approval. You're trying to become then the coach almost. Like some children with low self-esteem come from conflictual families or conditions where they've experienced abuse or neglect, situations where emotional support may be unavailable. In some cases, alternative sources of support can be arranged either informally through the encouragement of a teacher or a coach or a significant adult 
or more formally through organizations like Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Okay, I can already tell the problem with this room, right? It's like hardcore echoey. Um, I might move to an alternative location soon, but let's just maybe do a couple more. Self-efficacy. So think of self-efficacy. This is the Albert Bandura idea, right? That confidence is maybe too general of a word. That self-efficacy is more specific to specific things, right? Like if I was to ask you how good do you think you are as a writer, and then how good are you at math, and then how good are you at volleyball, and then how good are you at violin? It's like you'd have very different confidence levels in all those things, right? And another way of saying that is you'd have different levels of self-efficacy, different levels of belief in your ability to do that, to like pick up a violin and play a song or, or you know, spike a volleyball or whatever the other examples were, that you have these like kind of specific ideas about what you think you're able to do or not. Or not. So self-efficacy yeah, is the belief that one can master a situation or produce a, fav a favorable outcome that you can try to play it and actually do it. So Bandura, whose cognitive social theory we talked about, he thought that this idea of self-efficacy efficacy was an absolutely critical factor in development. I forgot my music. But it's students that have low self-efficacy so that they don't think they can do it. And you hear people's kids say stuff like this, right? I can't write, I can't read, I can't do math. Students with low self-efficacy for learning may avoid than anything that's difficult. So now this, you see how this becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy that if the kid doesn't think they can do it, then they don't try. And then they get another example for their mind about how they can't do it. And then that becomes like another thing that just, just builds in this narrative in their brain about how they can't do it. By contrast, kids with, with high self-efficacy eagerly work at learning tasks. Student with, students with high self-efficacy are more likely to expend more effort and persist longer at things, right? Because if you think about why, it's like, well, they're working from a perspective that says, like, if I work really hard and I do well on this, I'll do better. And even if I'm not doing well at it now, I can get better at it. But you're seeing, I want you to see how that's coming from this, like, deep, under the waves kind of belief or not that's that's going to be largely unconscious of like how you actually think you can do it some of it would be conscious i guess but the thoughts would about your belief i think would be conscious and then some of the reasons why would be unconscious so i kind of just stumbled into that point you can scratch that from your notes because it'd be an interesting discussion but it's kind of a side point the yeah, Epindura was much deeper than people think. Okay, next slide. So think of self-regulation. Think of you in, when you're feeling just normal or whatever, and then when you get really upset, and then when you calm back down, and you could kind of say like you come back to regular. So regular, regulation, self-regulation. Can you bring yourself back to regular? Can you control when you're and we think of that immediately like emotionally right like in terms of like when we were upset and there's absolutely a dimension of self-regulation that's emotional but there's also a, men, a dimension of self-regulation that's cognitive right like if i wanted to stay focused and keep working through slides can i do that without like being distracted by other things and so there's a part of it of like staying emotionally engaged and then there's a and and not um well regulated self-regulated then there's a part of it that's cognitive around attention and paying and keeping focus and then there's a part of it that's even physical about like not being too fidgety or not being too restless and being able to have the discipline to like stay focused on whatever you're doing and you see that as the kids getting older they're developing this self-regulation ability and that that's paired with all these other cognitive and performance related increases right so if you look at self-regulation there it's like deliberate so on purpose efforts to manage your own behavior and emotion and thoughts and that that's directly linked with this increased confidence socially and increased amounts of achievement right and increased social confidence basically meaning just like you, you do better in the world one of the most important aspects of themselves in middle and late childhood is this increased capacity for self-regulation this increased capacity is characterized by deliberate efforts 
to manage one's behavior, emotion, thoughts that lead to this increased social confidence and achievement. In a study by Blair and colleagues, higher levels of self-control assessed at four years of age is linked to improvements in math and reading in early elementary kids. A study of almost 70, this is a different study uh, by someone named Flory, a study of almost 1,700 kids that were aged three to seven revealed that self-regulation was a protective factor for kids growing up in, t in low social economic status conditions, right? So for kids growing up in, in, in potentially like tougher scenarios, their ability to self-regulate seemed to be a major factor in like affecting resiliency, which makes complete sense. This increased capacity for self-regulation is linked with the development of advances in the brain's prefrontal cortex. So another reason why these kids as they're getting older are getting better at paying attention and being a little bit less fidgety and being more focused and maybe controlling their temper tantrums is because it's their pref it's part of it is this their hardware is improving. Their prefrontal cortex is updating, right? Like we'd use the word myelinating. And we talked about this like prefrontal, I just have that note to students that we talked a lot about this prefrontal cortex idea in, uh, in chapter four. All right. So if you think of perspective taking, you think, okay, what would it be like to be my teaching in this room in Kamasoka College, right? And if you actually try to think for a sec, like, would it be like, it's like this place is like, feels like a ghost town today. It's right. It's like a Sunday evening. There's like no one here. It's like, I don't know how that necessarily is going to help you, but like, just even if you try to do that, my point is that it doesn't even necessarily matter. It's like, if you try to figure out what it would be like being me in this situation, it's like, what's that even mean? It's like some kind of complicated brain, uh, like brainstorm, but what's the word I'm looking for? Daydream that you're doing. It's like, you're, purposely using this kind of like active imagination to try to imagine what someone else's perspective would do and for a second you have to almost like pause your perspective and my point is just that this is like a pretty advanced cognitive skill you're doing that by the time kids are getting four or five they start to be able to describe themselves in and other people in psychological terms like they start to realize like okay this person's more loyal or I can trust this person or this person's nice or this person's mean. So this idea of my point here is kind of going to be that as the kids getting better able to understand themselves, they're getting better able to understand the other person at the same time. And part of that being able to understand the other person is being able to understand what it's like to be them. Right, so I see there like perspective taking involves assuming the perspective of others and trying to understand their thoughts and feelings. Okay. So, oh yeah, so I wanted to just make this point too. So around joint commitments, what's interesting about joint commitments is, say there's two kids playing and one of them's my kid, and I say, Evie, come here. Is she going to be like, say she's playing with her cousin Harvey, is she going to just come right to me, or is she going to be like, hang on, Harvey, I'll be back in a second, and then come back to me? And then that shows that she has, like, a commit, a shared commitment to what they're doing. That's what this word joint commitment means. And that it's like, well, if he wants, we're still playing this, and she's like talking when she's like, hang on, I'll be right back. Dick. Don't stop. Like, I'll, I'll be back in a sec. Just one sec. She like is almost talking to that shared mental world. Which is called like a joint understanding or like basically just that they're both like in the same headspace. So here's another interesting thing that I are associated with this stage because another they reach another kind of milestone when they realize that i can say things to you that aren't true i can lie to you and as soon as you, i realize that i can lie to you i also realize 
the flip that, well, yeah, but then that obviously means that you can lie to me too. And you can see that this is like related. I have the word there's, I used to, I think it used to say the birth of skepticism, right? That as soon as you realize that you can say things that aren't true, you also kind of realize that other people can too. And all this again is related to this prefrontal cortex development that I keep talking about. Yeah, so I have my note here. And an important part of child's, a child's social emotional development is this gaining an understanding that people don't always give an accurate report of their beliefs, aka can lie. Or can, it's not even always lie, like in some like dirty or mean way. It's like, you can ask me how I'm doing and I can say I'm doing good, even though I'm having a bad day. Like, I don't have to say a response that's a direct truth response triggered by what you ask. And once the kid learns that, and smarter kids lie earlier because they recognize this piece earlier, then they realize, he, you know, that words bend reality. It's a, the birth of skepticism, I guess. Yeah, but it's an interesting point, right? Perspective taking. So here are two other terms to give you. And the idea is that for you to take perspective, right? So like that kind of a freestyled example that was, wasn't my greatest, but when I was saying like, if you were pretending to be me in this situation, that actually demands a couple things. You have to, if you were to actually do that, right? And actually try to do that as a mental exercise, you'd have to stop thinking of, for you to take my perspective, you, you know, at least theoretically have to somewhat pause your perspective and you'd have to not think about other things and actually you doing a very specific type of daydreaming that you're trying to do demands not doing other things and if if you want me to say that a different way just think about how hard it is to stay focused on something and how quick your mind comes up with ideas to pull you away from it and that a big part of that focus or a big part of that ability to do any kind of complex thing like perspective taking is the ability to resist the urge to do something else. And you see like in a brain scan, like when you're focusing on something, you're not just focusing, you're also resisting. And so there's two things happening there. There's cognitive inhibition, like inhibition, stopping it, controlling those other thoughts so that you can keep focused on this considered perspective of the other. And then that demands like a cognitive flexibility because all that stuff I'm talking about is all happening. It's just like a, you know, thought, what was I calling it before? Active imagination. See, Carl Jung used to have this, he had this concept of active imagination that you could actually reach places through almost this like relaxed, super advanced, engaged and prompted daydreaming. Well, he called it active imagination. He called it like dreaming while awake. And he thought that because you were using, if you could get in the right state and do it, because you were using your full faculties that you could get to even deeper places than like in more meditative or trance states. So yeah, if you're interested in that concept, active imagination, Carl Jung with a J. So I'll just make uh, a few points on this because what's also children are now also becoming aware of gender much more. Right. And in developmental psych, we talk about gender as sort of the characteristics of people as either female or male gender identity, this sense of being a male or female. It's like one of the first things that kids develop right by three. Almost every kid can tell. It's one of the first things they'll be able to tell. Probably the first thing my daughter could tell you is which of her cousins were boys and which were girls. And then we get to this word of gender roles. And I'll talk a little bit about this, but whenever we say the word roles, I always want you to think of just to understand it as like this idea of theater, right? And then theater, different people are playing different roles. And if there's different gender roles, that would mean that there's like kind of different kind of expectations around behavior or way that you present associated with those roles. And that somehow you would learn those roles and then play those roles out. So it's a very nurture side of the argument. Okay, and, 
any full discussion of gender would would need to be nature and nurture would need to include from a nature perspective a conversation of things like chromosomes and hormones and evolution but another piece of it would be this these social considerations that we're going to look at here okay so you might notice if you had the earlier version that I took out the psychoanalytic piece, the Oedipal Oedipal, because I mean the Oedipal Electra, because I want to touch on that different in the second half of the course when I do my presentation on Ion. Um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Just I took out a couple slides and I'm going to reposition it later. So if you look at this social role theory idea that these differences maybe result from how people are taught they're supposed to be, the roles that they're taught they're supposed to play. In class, I'd always make the example, like if I pick two people in the class and I say, okay, let's do like an improv. And even though everyone, no one wants to do that idea, but let's just say that you were to do it. And one of you is the robber and one of you is the police officer and we're doing a bank heist scene. It's like, okay, go. And it's like, well, people, if they say that they were past their nerves and they were just ready to do it, it's like you kind of have in your mind, like the, cops probably chasing the bank robber person the bank robber person's probably got like a bag with money in it and it's like the cop probably has like you know stereotypical cop uniform it's like you're not starting from scratch it's you have kind of an idea of what that role is already so if you look at that kind of role theory is looking at this that it's very much like a learned thing, right? It's just like how we learn all kinds of things. We learn to copy habits that we associate with gender. Social cognitive theory looks at it a bit different. It looks almost at this idea of, and it's changing the ori, the point of origin where it's saying that, you know, like as we're growing up, we're getting these complex understandings in our head of what male and female is, and then we're acting in response to that. So rather than copying specific behaviors or habits of behavior we're actually adopting a certain self-concept and then acting in response to that according to social cognitive theories of gender a child's gender development occurs through observing and imitating what other people say and do and through being rewarded and punished for gender appropriate and gender inappropriate behaviors or what society what their society deems as such Okay, but, and so those sound similar, but the point I want to make that's different is like the social role theory is more this idea of what we would classically refer to as like role modeling, but just like the role modeling idea in relation to gender. And then the second idea is more about how that becomes actually a way that they see themselves and how that then dictates behavior. So that's actually like a, a specific distinction. So this would be a very interesting slide to talk with you about in person. I've had interesting discussions with my Kitchener students about topics similar to this. And this is where developmental psychology is interesting because in developmental psychology, we're very much taking this perspective of, don't tell me what you think or how you think people act. Let's actually observe it. And let's observe it across thousands and thousands of people and then see what kind of patterns we see. And then if those patterns are confusing and people ask, why are those patterns the way they are? A lot of those questions are actually evolutionary psychology and biology questions, right? Like a lot of the reasons things are the way they are. Like, okay, for example, mothers in a lot of societies across the world tend to be more strict with their daughters, especially around anything regarding physical safety and tend to put more rules on their daughters. And it's kind of interesting and you know some people might think that well there's there's actually a lot of things that can be interesting about that some of it's obviously related to trying to be protective some people might think it's being overly protective but then it's like well that's a tough question women also socially and emotionally develop faster so is that related to why moms are kind of naturally more protective it's this is a see again this is now i'm just kind of speculating in the world of evolution and how these pressures in our past would affect these things because it didn't come from any from nowhere if it's if it's affecting people all around the world in a way that's fairly general 
then the chances that it's random everywhere is low, right? That it must be some kind of response to something. Look at the fathers, you find some interesting things. You find, first of all, that if you just do this, and this is gonna be tough, right? Because I don't mean that dads love their daughters more than their sons, but if you just look at it from a time you should, uh, time scale perspective of like how much literal time, if you were observing, like how much time they're spending talking to their kid, how much time they're with them, how much time they're reading to them, how much time everything, ten, dads tend to give more attention to their daughters, just statistically tend to engage in more activity kind of stuff with sons, tend to really push intellectual development in both, tend to push sons more towards things like competition and conflict and more things around like risk taking. Again, if you're like, why? Well, that's going to have a deep evolutionary reason too. The fact that through a lot of human history, young men were preparing to be soldiers, it's like that's somewhere deep stamped into the DNA too. It's like all these, and these are where these questions, it's like kind of hard to have in a one-sided scenario where you don't have a chance to like respond or ask me something live. It would be interesting sometime to do something a little bit more uh, synchronous, but, but I just want to kind of tell you this again. It's like in a lot of these points in these slides are kind of um, not summaries of the textbook, but like kind of, yeah, it's summation points. And then I try to make a, Cool presentation around it sort of and or as good as I can and then to let you kind of have these ideas and try to struggle with this right it's kind of like, or not struggle with it but think about it it's interesting and a lot of the what we see when we look at humans is developmental psych and a lot of the well why is it like that is starting to get into questions of evolution So in the textbook, it was discussing how when you talk to, when you survey boys at this age and girls that there's more reports of feeling pressure to conform to more traditional male roles for boys than for girls. Now think about if you think that, that again, this would be interesting to talk about in person, but the idea that like for boys growing up, there's more pressure for them to dress and speak and act and talk in ways that are considered traditionally masculine and there's more flexibility in what sort of the general person or there's just more flexibility to step outside the box in terms of clothes and how people talk and all that stuff with girls and i know that this is like a, a difficult topic in a way but um and this is why i'm kind of sticking to what people report trying to stay away from just giving any kinds of opinions because what I'm really saying is that there's gender is complicated and that there's more, it's not as easy as just being um, just like, what am I trying to say? That there's, well, that, that next point that there's definite overlap, right? And there's definitely this idea that gender differences are more statements of averages. But then again, it's like, how many times have I said that in this class? This is true with anything. There's, there's so much individual level differences in things and that, yeah, gender differences are averages. They're not a list of characteristics of every single person. And some of these differences are related to things like biology, like we mentioned earlier, like things like chromosomes and, and hormones and, and evolutionary influences. And then some of them are more related to social cultural or nurture style variables right things like the social roles that we I, I use social role theory and social cognitive theory but basically like the role of parenting and society and media and everything in shaping how we see things oh, sorry sorry to hit the mic tray that probably sounded terrible okay next slide don't worry i'll pop in every few slides so you can see my a nice bald head. Uh, parents play, okay, sorry, that's a lame segue. So I wanna make this distinction now between emotion coaching and emotion dismissing. So think of, well, here, I'll just say this. Parents can play an important role in helping kids regulate their emotions. Depending on how they talk with kids about emotions, parents can be described as taking more of an emotion coaching or an emotion dismissing approach. 
The distinction between these approaches is most evident or most noticeable in terms of how parents deal with when a child is displaying negative emotion. Emotion coaching parents will monitor their child's emotion, view their child's negative emotion as maybe an opportunity for teaching, assist them in labeling their emotion, coach them in how to deal with their emotion effectively. In contrast, emotion dismissing parents view their role more as to deny or ignore or change these negative emotions. And these emotion coaching, or sorry, emotion coaching parents can interact with their kids in a less rejecting manner and use more scaffolding and praise and more nurturance and are more, more so than emotional dismissing parents. So this is basically like saying, like when your kid's upset, are you trying to use that as an opportunity? And of course, no one's perfect and does this all the time and people get tired and all these variables that are obviously there. But in general, like do you try to use when your child's emotional to help them process that and understand that and, and get better at it next time? Or is it always just about being quiet? Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Stop the expression. Suppress the emotion, dismiss the emotion. Okay, children of emotion coaching parents develop better skills at soothing themselves when they get upset, are more effective at regulating a negative mood, more better at focusing their attention, have less behavioral problems. Studies have found that father's emotional coaching was highly related to social skill development and that mom's emotional coaching was highly linked with less observational or op oppositional behavior, so like dealing better with other adults. which is pretty interesting that like once when that, that relationship with mom is really stable and, and developed and there's a coaching element that that really helps them deal with other potential authority figures in your life, which can be really important. So as this kid, again, I always say this, I say it way too much. Um, as the kid's getting older, but the idea is that by 10 years old, most children are using a lot of kind of cognitive or thought-based strategies for calming themselves down. So say if they're really upset, say you're really upset and you have to do a presentation in 20 minutes and you're upset right now and you know you have this presentation coming and you can't get out of it and you need to calm yourself down. What would you do? Right? And maybe you do some like breathing exercises or maybe you'd like, oh, sorry. Maybe you try to like think about what's going on and try to give yourself perspective or maybe you try to like think about the nice thing you're going to do after it's all done to try to calm yourself down but notice how all those things are like cognitive strategies well breathing's obviously physical but like even planning to do that you're starting to now use your mind to help you calm yourself down and this is linked to this like developing emotional awareness and this developing awareness of self and so I have this as kind of a list, right? And this, this is from a bunch of things that like the child's emotional understanding starts to really get better. I'll tell you this story. My daughter was like upset the other day because she was playing some game and she, they were spelling out letters and she went to do spell out like an F, but she made it wrong with her hands and made a T. And then the one girl like laughed and another girl went ha ha. And then she was like all upset because she thinks that the people in her class don't know, don't think she knows how to make a T. It's like, that sounds like so silly and dumb, but then you're like, well, no, this is like a grade one's level of something happened at school that wasn't fun because she felt like she looked dumb in front of people. It's like, who can't relate to that? And that as she's, her understanding of that's getting better and like, she couldn't tell me for a while. And then as she was getting ready for bed, she was like, okay, I remember why I was upset. And then she told me about that. And she told me that she was like, she felt really embarrassed when it happened right and it's like that's interesting because she's now getting better at able being able to tell me like how she felt earlier in the day like this is almost like mental time travel the notes say and at the same time they're starting to realize that they can have more than in another way they are they're also realizing that they can have more than one emotion at the same time right you know that you could have like a blind date tonight that you're nervous and excited for right and that you can have like multiple things can be you know surprising and 
and joyful or whatever, right? That you can have multiple emotions at the same time. They're starting to get this more and more complex. They're starting to understand things that lead to certain emotions, right? That and when this happens, this tends to be associated with me feeling better or calming down or getting upset or I have this like better understanding of the triggers of those better able at, they're getting better at suppressing negative emotion. Noticing when they're, well, pushing down bad feelings. They're getting better at redirecting their feelings and better at understanding what it must be like to be other people. Right, understanding that like, well, I like when I have nice things and so you must like when you have nice things and you start to see this as like associated with more pro-social behavior, right? The opposite of antisocial, like pro-social, like things that actually make people more likely to engage you in more interactions in the future. Okay, so the development of moral or moral development, if you think of morals as meaning right and wrong, right? If I ask you, is it right to, you know, the classic, steal a loaf of bread to feed uh, your dying spouse or whatever who's dying of hunger and is stealing bad in that scenario? And if you say yes and I say why, or if I say, if you say no and I say why, your answer to my why question is your moral reasoning, the reason for why you said yes or no. And as the kid is getting a more complex understanding of their world, their understanding of what's right and wrong is developing, they're morally developing. They're having this development of thoughts and feelings and behaviors regarding the kind of rules and what's traditional or what's that's what convention means, like what's the kind of uh, norm of their society, how people should act, how they should behave, what's right and wrong. And part of, this is kind of related to this idea in psychology of the marshmallow test, right? If I give you like, the kid the option of a marshmallow now or if i if he waits for a few minutes he can have two and you see that like once kids get to a certain age it's pretty easy for them to wait and have the two but when they're younger it's really hard and kids that are actually better at doing that even when they're younger show like huge cognitive improvements even later in life and are actually more likely if you actually pass the marshmallow test as a kid you're more likely to finish your university as an adult They've done like interesting studies on that, right? So just my point here is that part of staying focused is related to this ability to resist temptation. And that's an important part of what we consider self-control. Yeah, that last part, learning behaviors that will improve another person's emotional state helps the child um, around moral development, right? And that's like a big thing you can help with as a, as a parent is help your kid learn how to be a be pro-social in situations and how to do things to help people and then that becomes something they do and that becomes like like i was saying like part of their moral development so i want to try to do this in a way that's a little bit fun so i want to look at four different famous tv fathers and try to show different parenting styles. I didn't really realize until after I made this presentation that I was only focusing on dads and I should, when I update it next, I'll, I'll focus a bit on two of the moms, but I want to show these as, as different examples, right? So Bunrein thinks that parents should be neither too punitive, so like you shouldn't be too much punishment based and you also shouldn't be distracted and aloof means like not involved. That kids need to have rules and affection. They need to have rules and love. Okay, so for these next group of families, what we're gonna do is like look at these families and then try to assess this question. Like in this family, do you see, and then we're gonna be looking at the dad. Do you see the dad showing love towards the kid? And do you see the dad showing clear rules that are enforced? So those are two variables, affection shown, right? We're not actually asking like, does the dad love the kid? We're gonna assume that that's the case. We're asking if we were sitting there with a checklist, do we actually see displays of that love? Okay, so authoritarian, right, you hear that word a lot. Just think of what that would mean, right? It's like, you can obviously see that it has the word authority in it. So it's an authoritarian, someone that's like drunk with power. And we use that word like authoritarian 
or drunk with their authority. It's like we use that in relation to like politicians or whatever. But like in this sense, she's meaning it is. Well, yeah, when you have that that in at the end of the word, because I'm going to show you in, this is one of the critiques of this model is the two words are kind of similar. Like she calls one style authoritarian and one style authorita authoritative. Right. And you'll see how they both kind of have the authority is the main start of the word and the difference is the ending. And when you have that Aryan at the end, like the like Canadian or American, it's like at the end of the word, it means that you're like, that's like the definitive feature. It's like the definitive feature, the most clear thing about Red Foreman on that 70s show is he's kind of this like strict authority dad. And I wanted to use him as this example, right? It's like, I'm sure he loves his kids. It's not, a, but remember, it's not about if he loves his kids in his own mind or heart. It's about if you were sitting there in the room with a clipboard, would you see expressions of that? And with him, you probably wouldn't, but you would see expressions of the rules. So he would say this one, you wouldn't see the expression of the love, but you would see the expression of the rules. So this is more authoritarian. And then people, students in my class before I brought up the idea that like, if we were talking about Kitty, the mom, it would be a different evaluation. And I usually use that to make this point that that's an interesting thing about parenting style is sometimes even two parents can have different styles and they can even have different styles with different kids in the family. So it's kind of complicated, but these this language still is relevant. So authoritarian, authoritarian parenting is a restrictive, more punishment based parenting style. Where the kid needs to follow the directions and expect, respect the work and effort of the parent. The authoritarian parent places firm limits and control on the kid and allows for little verbal back and forth. For an example, an authoritarian parent might say things like, do it my way or the or or else, right? My way or the highway. You can see like Red Foreman saying stuff like that. Authoritarian parents might also punish the child frequently, might enforce rules rigidly and not explain them, might show anger towards the kid. Children of authoritarian parents often score as more unhappy, more fearful, more anxious when comparing themselves to others. They also tend to fail to initiate activity, right? So they tend to, which remember what we were talking about earlier, right? Initiative. They tend to, it tends to be stalled when the parent's too authoritative which sort of makes sense, right? Because we were saying earlier that the cost of the parent stifling initiative is this internalized guilt. Can have, and the children can also have weak communication skills, right? Because they're not in a situation where they have a chance to have verbal back and forth. Okay, so the next parent I wanna talk about, and this is a weird one because this is actually like, I'm gonna talk about Uncle Phil. Right. And Uncle Phil in this show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which I'm sure you've, most of you at least have seen, which is like, you know, as popular as shows get. When I was growing up in like Uncle Phil is an uncle, but in some ways is one of the best representations of a dad on TV. And I'm going to make this argument that this is the style of um, parenting most associated with all different kinds of developmental success for kids. Right. That this is a scenario where how many episodes of Fresh Prince are about Will doing something dumb and then Phil like helping him get out of Uncle Phil helping him get out of the situation, but making sure that he also like learns a lesson through it. And there's always like it wasn't like Uncle Phil was a pushover. He had rules. So authoritative parenting encourages kids to be independent, but still places limits and controls on their action. There's more extensive verbal back and forth allowed. Parents are more warm and nurturing towards their child. An authoritative parent might put their arm around their kid in a comforting way and say something like, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Let's talk about how you can handle that next time, right? Which is like every Fresh Prince episode. Authoritative parents show, pl show pleasure and support in responding to their children's constructive behaviors. They also expect more independent, age-appropriate behaviors. Children whose parents are authoritative often score as more cheerful, more self-controlled, more self-reliant, more achievement oriented, better at maintaining friendships with peers, better at cooperating with adults, better at managing stress. So I say this that before the guy in this picture was the grandpa on Modern Family. He was the dad on Married with Children and played a very different character, played like a more 
Married with Children was a huge show. Like it followed The Simpsons on I think Sunday nights or maybe it was Thursday nights. I forget. But Married with Children was a huge, huge show, and it was funny. And he was like kind of the dumb dad that was like, you know, the high school sports star that like never grew up and was like he worked at a shoe store and he he was like he was hilarious but he was like i don't know not a very involved dad i'm using him as my example for neglectful parents so it's so like i'm not praising him too much and i'm sure al bundy loves his kids but if you were observing him you wouldn't see many expressions of that and you'd see no expressions of rules so if you're looking from bun ryan's criteria you're saying no to both of the questions. Neglectful parenting is a style in which the parents are un more uninvolved in the kid's life. Children whose parents are neglectful can develop the sense that their parents' lives are more important than theirs are. These children tend to be socially incompetent. Many have poor self-control, don't handle independence well. They frequently will have low self-esteem, be immature, feel alienated from their family. In adolescence, they tend to show patterns of truancy and delinquency. So this has this is associated with with negative outcomes for sure. And then the last one I want to look at is uh, from The Sopranos, and this is like my favorite show. But and if you haven't ever watched it, you should sometime maybe over the break check out Sopranos. It's especially if you're interested in psychology, it's a fascinating show because Tony Soprano's character is like the head of the mob, but he's also experiencing panic attacks, right? So he's going to a therapist and. The woman that plays the therapist on Sopranos is also like, in a way, one of the best actors on or actresses on like any show. Like her character is fantastic. A huge part of the show is her character. And so like he's he's going through these like he's like a tough guy mobster with this super complicated situation going on. And at the same time, he's having these panic attacks and seeking help for it. And it's like the the decon or the duality of it is really interesting but i would I'd classify him as an indulgent or what's sometimes called permissive parent and permissive is a, a more more defining word in a way because think of that as being related to the word permission it's like tony soprano clearly loves his daughter meadow and shows his love to her all the time and buys her all kinds of stuff but like there's like zero rules right so he would score high on the shown affection displayed affection but really low on um, rules and consistency indulgent parenting is a style in which the parents are highly involved with their kids but place very few demands or controls on them parents let their children do what they want some parents will deliberately rare their raise their kids in this way because they think that a combination of a warm environment and few restraints on the kids produces a more confident child however development psychology literature says very different. Children whose parents are indulgent rarely learn to respect others, have difficulty controlling their behavior, tend to be more egocentric, more non-compliant, have less satisfactory peer relationships. Right, so her research is really clear that what kids need more than anything else is consistency and attention and love. I'll do this slide quick because this is a tough slide and I won't too many examples or anything but like obviously another major issue at this age is like if you look at something like iq right there's not a ton you can do to improve a kid's iq there's definitely a lot you can do to stiffen it though to destroy it and a lot of it includes things like malnutrition and, and you know all the difficult to talk about types of abuse So as the kid, okay, so this is kind of interesting, right? If you put a bunch of two-year-olds or two to four-year-olds in the same room, especially if they're brothers and sisters, like siblings, they'll fight every 10 minutes or so. That they're actually the age bracket where you'll see the most conflict. Now, oftentimes, the fighting is over like toys or over what show to watch or whatever. It's like minor stuff, but... 
As kids are getting older, you see less and less of that. The rate of conflict declines from age five to seven, especially because they're getting a lot better verbally. So that's an interesting point. It's also interesting to note how many families now in Canada have only one parent, and that has a huge impact. And I'll show you a stat in a sec. Another interesting point is how much uh, the parental employment affects the kids. So my point on this would be that like my, my kid doesn't care if I come in here to the college and I sit and I talk to a computer or if I sit and I talk to a bunch of students. What they care about is who how it affects my mood when I come home, the nature of the work. Does the work like stress me out constantly? Am I constantly stressed? Right, children in, in scenarios where it's a divorce or a step family tend to have more problems with adjustment. And a lot of that comes to this idea that one issue with divorce is that it tends to be associated with changes in parenting style. A lot of times kids are in an authoritative parenting scenario and it changes to a more permissive style very commonly in divorce. So that's an important thing to keep in mind is that what kids, one of the things that really affects kids is that that break in routine. And then that last point that attachment is still important and this attachment is becoming more sophisticated though and the child's social world is starting to expand and including more people, including like teachers and their peers and less direct time with parents, but parents are still a key developmental influence. So I thought you'd just find this um, table kind of interesting, right? That like, if you see in the States, the amount of families or the amount of um, percentage of single parent families with a kid under 18, it's almost a quarter. Canada, it's around 15%. As kids grow older, that's like my most used segue. Uh, it's like cliche at this point. I, mean, I literally wrote it on the slide there. They spend an increasing amount of time with other peers, right? So this is gonna be where I try to bite my tongue about the pandemic because one of the biggest issues with this was that kids weren't around kids. It's like Bandura told it, said it very clearly. There's certain things that kids can't learn from parents. There's certain things that are only learned horizontally is what he said. It's like they're only learned from peers, things like cooperation and, and friendship level intimacy and, and certain aspects of conflict management and certain aspects of cooperation and loyalty. The good peer relations contribute to normal social emotional development, especially in middle and late childhood. And that, that those relationships, those key interchanges are like the most important psychologically significant developmental variable for kids during that elementary time period. Kids need to be around other kids in person. Then if, if anyone ever pushed you on that, right, say you're trying to make that argument and anyone's like trying to push you on this concept of, well, well, isn't like just you know, your two years of your daughter's kindergarten being on Zoom, fine. It's like, well, it definitely affects how much friends they develop. It's like, well, what, what, what's the function of friendship? Like, what does friendship actually do? I'd argue there's actually six things it does. Like, first of all, companionship and having like friends in the most base sense of the term is a huge part of our psychology. It shapes how we see ourselves. There's the, the stimulation aspect, right, of just being like, bored, silly, having nothing to do, like needing somebody to, that's your same kind of cognitive level that thinks similar things are interesting, that there's a whole like aspect of when you're playing and you're doing games and you're running around and stuff, you're actually kind of learning your body and you're developing your physical skill set. You're also learning about who you are and who you are to other people and who other people are to you and this whole idea of developing your, I have there the word ego support, but this idea of developing your sense of who you are. And if all of the research story is clear that a big part of this period of life is this developing understanding of yourself in relation to other people, it's like, well, what if all those other people disappear and are just replaced by people on the screen or by more YouTube videos? Right, and what's, and then let's just get biological about this. What's, what's that lack of actual intimacy? Like, you know, when, 
when a kindergarten says something funny to their other kindergarten aged friend and that friend laughs, they both have a dopamine spike. They both have an oxytocin, oxytocin spike, right? Yeah, oxytocin. I always almost say oxycotton, right? But but basically the bonding chemical, right? So they both have like a, an enjoyment and a bonding biochemistry. Like there's that doesn't happen on Zoom. So I come around the corner and this guy is standing there like this, right? The guy that's like this with his arm up in the air. And it's like, maybe that's a guy I like kind of like. I'm going to pretend I'm like a school age kid, right? And he's standing there with two girls. And let's pretend like one of the girls I have a crush on. And like when I turn the corner, I could almost tell that they it seemed like they were talking about me. And she like looked at me and then like looked back to the other girl and they kind of laughed. Okay, so now this is a weird example, I know. But I'm going to try to explain... What's going on in the brain, pretending I'm the kid in this scenario, right? That what's, what's happening really quickly is I'm like, okay, if that scenario actually happens, I'm like selectively attending to cues. Really, I'm really noticing that that girl that I had the crush on looked looked away and then smiled as if she was laughing on a point that the other girl had said before. But notice how I'm reading so much into that. I'm like attributing so much intent, intent which means like why she did it into that fact. Then I'm saying, okay, well, this guy's like, maybe he's like being cool here. And I want to like look cool in front of this girl, so that's my goal. So I've noticed the look away. I've noticed everyone's facial expressions. I, in my mind, this is all in this pieces of pieces of seconds. In my mind, I've attributed why it's like it is. Now I have a goal. I want to look cool in this situation, so I'm like, this is gonna be. So then I memorize. I think in my mind, how do you be cool? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do a cool handshake. I make the decision to do that, and then I enact the behavior. I do it. So for me to do that handshake. I gotta read the social cues. I gotta try to understand why it is why it is. I gotta then make a goal in relation to that. Then I gotta figure out how I would achieve that goal. And then I gotta make the decision to do that thing. And then I gotta do that. And those are all six steps in the social information processing. And you know, just to rant for a little bit more because Kids need this imaginary play world. They need to play. They need to have one thing that is really interesting is if kids are denied rough and tumble play. So if, if especially from a dad, if, if kids don't have a dad that wrestles with them, the likelihood that they experience anxiety in their teen and early adult years goes up dramatically, especially for girls. And that's not, not me. That's not my opinion. That's true and that's interesting and one of the reasons it's interesting is because one thing wrestling and kind of tumbling they call it rough and tumble play does is helps you learn that you can feel anxious and then calm back down and you can be kind of scared but still okay and that it one thing that happens when kids play is they process anxiety it's like I think that we often underestimate how much of a connection there is between those two things and how children playing, it's like when we're saying it, they're like burning off their pent up energy or whatever. It's like, well, what does that actually mean? Like it will like literally, it means that they're, they're working through some of that stored complexes of energy, right? And they're like working through some of that anxiety that they couldn't necessarily articulate. It's like good for their whole system. They learn that they can overcome problems. It's like play has all these important developmental aspects. And this idea that this kid that they're running around, you know, chasing dragons with sticks, even though they're just running around in the backyard, it's like that that imaginative aspect of that and cognitive development go together. That's like helping their brain develop and get more fine-tuned. It's actually the display of high-end cognition. And I said at that last point in the last slide, I was like engaged in high end cognition. What I mean by that is that like we actually, when we see other animals being playful, we would take that as a sign of intelligence, right? Like a really simple dumb animal is not going to play because think of what play is. It's like play is like activity for its own sake. It's like 
doing something that's not related to like eating or sleeping or sex or or drinking or any of those more uh, need-based bio, biological uh, instinctual drives that would affect an animal's behavior. It's like play is doing it just because you enjoy it. It's for the kind of intrinsic motivation aspect, right? So you see like certain kinds of dogs will play with some and like dolphins will play and ravens will play and different kinds of species play. And that play is actually significantly uh, is a significant indicator of intelligence. And there's different types of play, right? Like when my daughter Charlotte was first a baby, like her play was more what you consider sensory motor. Like she would like play with things, but it was more about like shapes and textures and objects. And right, she's like developing her understanding of kind of objects and things, right? And part of that is almost like a practice play too, or this reputation of, of skills. And then as the child's getting better, they're starting to like do this like pretense play. Like you hear kids play the game like the floor is lava, right? And you have to put pebbles on the floor and jump from pillow to pillow and you can't touch the floor because the floor is lava. That's a pretense. The pretense means like, think of pretense as being like something we agree on and then we play. It's like pretense in this scenario is that carpet equals lava. Okay, so then stay off the carpet, right? Pretense, symbolic. Social play is like playing with other people, right? Constructive play is kind of like a combo of the the sensory motor and practice play and, and with that more symbolic aspect. And then we have like actual games, right? Where it's like more structured, more rule-based games or a rule-based play. Right, and that all these are related to this developing cognitive uh, processing system, AKA brain. I've struggled with how much to talk about this. I feel like developmental psychology as a field has let, has been completely silent on this topic. It's hard to know how to even present it except as, as a defense of children. It's like I've been, I probably taught a course either called lifespan development or like developmental psych or like his different institutions called developmental psych slightly different things. I probably taught like almost 30 classes of that, right? Like I teach developmental psych, for example, at Conestoga in the winter, fall and spring every year, three times a year. So I've been teaching for a long time and I've been even doing it at Nipissing. This is my third year. It's like, all this stuff's clear. This isn't a secret to anybody. Of course, developmental delays are gonna be coming. Of course, there's gonna be uh, an increase in behavioral issues in the schools like never seen. Of course, there's gonna be mental health crises. Of course. It's, it's absolutely essential. It's not just nice. It's, it's actually a critical part of development. The kids are around other kids. It's like this play is key. It's like you can, you can actually delay the cognitive development even in animals by just not letting them play enough with their siblings. And this idea of free play on the decline, it's like, well, one of the ideas is like, that I really try to encourage with my daughter is like, let's just go in the backyard and we'll just do whatever, right? It's like, if she wants to run around on the trampoline or if she wants to just like, you know, kick around the leaves or just do whatever. It's like, it doesn't always have to be an activity. Sometimes it's just about playing and then, but I'm also like a fan of actual sports. I think there's no necessary problem with organized play, but I think especially the beauty is almost the yin yang idea. If you can somehow, you know, blend the two, it's like, they're both important. And again, the screen time stuff, it's like kind of obvious, right? It, but what are you going to do? Just become a huge screen time critic in 2022 when like everyone's life basically demands being on the computer all the time. It's like, I think it's about becoming adaptable to this, right? Maybe pre COVID complaining about screen time made sense, but then what happens when, you know, my daughter's in or whoever, right? I don't know to be personal about it, but when like my daughter's like doing all of her kindergarten on zoom and she's getting more 
Zoom school class time per day than what you're recommending them to be on screen time a day. So what, they just like never watch TV and they can never watch a tablet for a second or play a video game? It's like, again, all this stuff's got shifted so much, right? But in general, it's like, The more you can have your kids outside, the more you can have them doing things, the more you can have them engaged, right? That that play is actually key to development. It's like, it's not just nice. It's like they're building their brains. When they're playing, they're building their brains. And they're teaching themselves how to act in the super complicated world. And some of that they have to learn in a way that's not just told to them by someone older. They have to lose sometimes and they have to win sometimes and they have to be embarrassed sometimes and they have to feel happy sometimes and, and proud and they have to sometimes not get picked for the team. And it's like all those parts, the not get picked for the team, that was maybe too much because that's like, what I mean is just like, one of the things that kids that grow up playing sports have as an advantage over people that don't is one thing that you absolutely learn in sports is that you can be really good and you can still lose sometimes you can be a really 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 good hockey player and you're not going to win every game you know they can even make this comment that like even the best three-point shooter in the nba sh sh hits less than 50 percent of their shots it's like Like a really good three-point shooter is like someone that's shooting in the 40 percentages. That hits 40 about out of 100. Misses 60. Saying is, I don't know why I'm talking about basketball, but just making this point that like play matters, and it does. It matters because it's developmentally significant. All right, my friends. This presentation is coming to a conclusion and let's do our lightning round here okay in air and the last time i tried it i tried to go super intense i was like welcome to the lightning round blah blah, blah and then i messed up so okay let me i'll try this again and i'll leave this in just so just to keep it real with you welcome to the quiz review lightning round first point in erickson's theory early childhood is this period when development involves resolving the conflict between initiative versus guilt. Middle childhood is a period when development involves resolving the conflict of industry versus inferiority, and parents play a key role in helping kids resolve this conflict. Number two, children's understanding of self changes throughout childhood. Self-concept refers to the domain-specific aspects of evaluation, right? So domain-specific means like area-specific or like how good you are at one area or one domain would be like math and sports and music and it means that it's just like you have an idea of how good you are in all these different areas whereas self-esteem is more global meaning not sp domain specific global is like the opposite of domain specific it's also called sometimes self-worth or self-image self-efficacy and self-regulation are linked to a kid's competence and achievement so how good they are and how well they do right so those things are actually different variables right because you could be really good at something but not necessarily realize that potential. Careful thought is needed to promote health, healthy self-esteem. Okay, children's understanding of others becomes more adult-like as they develop this ability to take perspective. We talked about how gender refers to the psychological and social dimensions of being male and female, that psychoanalytic, and again, I kind of side burnered that because it's such a huge topic i'm going to talk about that in my presentation on ion next term um it's like my last presentation for you but both psychoanalytic theory and social cognitive theories emphasize this idea of how parents influence gender peers are especially adept at rewarding gender appropriate behavior so as much as we talk about society most of the pressure kids feel to act a certain way is coming at a peer level not at a but then you could also make the obvious point of like well, what's influencing those peers perspectives and then that probably brings you back to things like media okay number five children young children's range of emotion expands during early childhood as they increasingly experience more what we would call self-conscious emotions 
things like pride or shame or guilt. Children's benefit, children benefit from having emotion uh, coaching parents. As children get older, they use a greater variety of coping strategies. We talked about more cognitive strategies. They also show more increased emotional understanding. Number six, moral development involves thoughts, feelings, and actions regarding the rules and regulations about what other people should do in their interactions with others. Piaget proposed cognitive changes in child's moral reasoning. Uh, I don't think I directly talked about that, but I will. Behavioral uh, and social cognitive theorists argue that there's considerable situational variables in moral behavior, which basically means that like just what you think is right and wrong depends on situations. And what Piaget said is that how you do that calculation is largely influenced by your age. Right, so the older the kid, the more likely they are to steal the bread to save their starving parent. Okay. I'm just going to put these all up so I don't, because I think I've told you this before, but if you press it one too many times, it kind of wrecks the recording. So number seven, perspective taking and social relationships are both uh, influence moral reasoning, right? So like your how skilled you are socially and how deep your relationships are and all that stuff and your ability to take another person's perspective is influ influences as you get better at that you tend to get better at judging right and wrong authoritarian authoritative neglectful and indulgent parenting styles produce different results authoritative parenting is the style most associated with social competence um in terms of physical punishment we didn't talk much about that but there's little evidence that little evidence meaning not much that physical punishment shows benefit it can lead to child maltreatment i'll make a point on this the idea is that physical punishment before two makes no sense because the child's not old enough to understand the connection between the two things and physical punishment after 13 makes no sense because the risk of embarrassment is too high and in Canada there's very specific rules around what's allowed and what's not allowed and that's where in a class like this it's like I would, I would kind of just default to, to what's allowed and make the point that from a developmental psychology perspective alternatives to physical punishment are much more in line with what would be suggested for parents. because of the risk to the child and the lack of potential benefit. Uh, siblings interact with each other in positive and negative ways. Parents can help their children to navigate and get better at working through conflict. 11, peers are powerful socialization agents, right? So as the, as the kids now deep in the school years, their kid, their friends, I mean, are having a huge influence on how they're making sense of the world, friends, peers, whatever. I guess peers is a more broad word than friends, right? Because obviously there's people that were in your class and that were your peers age-wise that weren't your friends. That peer group provides a source of information and comparison about the world that exists outside the family. Number 12, among the most widely studied types of play are the ones we looked at there. Sensory motor, practice play, pretense play, social play, constructive play, games, and that this play serves several important functions, including affiliation with peers, tension relief, it helps advance cognitive development, it helps exploration and just curiosity, it gives this sense of safety, it's like kids that do it less have more anxiety, there's serious concerns about the decline of play in North America. Thank you. Thank you to my Nipsing students and thank you if you like held in here and listened to this whole presentation. This is like you know, about an hour 40, but uh, we covered some good ground. We got one more chapter presentation coming up on, uh, and it's going to be a little bit more sciencey, like chapter maybe uh, two or five, where or three, where it's going to be, I'll have some videos and stuff, because we're looking at now the physical aspect of, well, puberty, right? Uh, adolescence is next, and uh, we're getting close to wrapping up the course, so if people have any questions or anything, please reach out, and uh, Yeah, for the people still listening, I'm slowing things down a bit next term. I think uh, I bit off a lot in a lot of areas this term, and I think next term I'm going to slow down and focus a little more on family. I'm going to do less teaching at Nipsing um, and just kind of focus on I need to, like, you know, really get back into try to get back into 
good shape and try to focus on spending lots of time with my girls and outside and I'm I'm gonna keep the psych class with you so I'm gonna do the the CHSF 21 or not psych class the CHSF class I mean I'm, my loyalty is with Roxana and I'm gonna do the CHSF uh, 2107 right which is this the sister course to this the paired course to this and uh, but I was gonna do like I have other uh, courses I often do in the winter with Nipsing, like a positive psychology course and this like mental health coaching course I've done before. And you can access that stuff on the website. But I don't know if you've liked the course, keep in, keep on. Maybe next, maybe next term, next year there'll be more courses. But for this year it'll just be the psych next term, okay? And then maybe if you're interested, I might be aiming at having like some. 400 level courses for the spring okay so maybe in the spring term I want to just really use this winter term to kind of get not that like things are bad but just to kind of get you know my sleep straight my, my physical straight like my spend time with my wife and kids and I've just been I love what I'm doing but I just you know I need to get a little bit back to basics so I think I'm just gonna work a tiny bit less next term and with that all that means the only reason I'm saying that is just to say like I am going to do the continuation of this course and uh and then if you're interested or if you've enjoyed it please uh you know keep keep on the look I might let I might send an email letting people know if I'm going to do a spring course or whatever anyways I'm getting rambly I didn't mean to say any of that love you just take care